After we left those hills and moved into the little town of Tahlequah, we didn't stay there long until the Depression days come along. Right away, my people were, well, they were just on starvation. My father took up the trade of carpentry, and he made a carpenter out of me. To this day, that's the only thing I know, other than writing. It finally got so tough on us in that little town, a large family, we moved over to the little a town. I, I think it had around 20,000 people in it at that time. It was Muskogee, Oklahoma. We moved into an old house down close to the railroad tracks. And boy, these were tough days. And from our backyard, you could see the freight trains coming in and out of the yards. And the trains were just loaded down with hobos. And then not far from where we lived, there was a little creek. And there was a hobo jungle on this creek. I used to go down and listen to the hobos talk. Boy, what fascinating stories. Far away places. Places I just heard of, never dreaming that I'd ever see any of them. The Rocky Mountains of Colorado and the fruit harvest. The Joaquin Valley of California. The hay harvest in Wyoming and the Jackson Hole country. The potatoes in Idaho. That's all they talked about was where you could get a job. One day I told my father, I said, I'm going to leave home. You can't feed my brothers and sisters much less. I was a pretty good sized boy by this time. He thought it was all right, but my mother didn't. But we talked her into it, and I left home for the first time in my life. I think I must have been uh, 16 when we moved out of those hills. I think I must have been 18, I could have been 17. But I never will forget the day that I left home because it was a very sad day in my life. We were a very close family, and I was the only one that had ever left. For three years, I did nothing but bum around over this country looking for work, and there wasn't no work, very little. You know, I found out something during those three years that I didn't know anything about. I was a loner. To this day, I'm still a loner. I think it was because of those years that I lived in those hills and I had no boys to play with or run around with. I think that was the cause of it. I don't like to go to dances or parties. And uh, if I go hunting or fishing, I like to be alone. And uh, no boy should grow up like that. It's, every boy should have one good friend or a buddy, but I didn't. During those three years that I bummed around all over the country, I kept writing. I couldn't quit. Every chance I got, I'd write on something. And sometimes, I, she said, I didn't have money enough to buy a writing paper with. But this writing had gotten such a hold on me that uh, I wouldn't let anything stand in my way. I, I used to go around in the alleys and strange little towns, and I'd take the brown paper sacks from the trash cans, and I'd cut the bottom of them out and split them open, and I had a big sheet of paper. Take the brown paper from boxcars and cut it up into strips. I wrote a lot of stories on that old brown paper. But I was so ashamed of those stories and the writing. I couldn't spell anything. I can't do very good to this day. I couldn't punctuate anything. That was out. That was out. I couldn't do that. I'd just write one line after the other. Wherever my voice broke, there was a dash. There was no paragraph. It's just one line after the other. I have the old handwritten manuscripts. When I go to the schools, 
I take them with me sometime and show them to the kids. Try to prove to them what a man can do if he really wants to do it. But you know, even though I wouldn't let anyone even look at anything I wrote, I was so ashamed of it, but I wouldn't throw those stories away. Why, I don't know. Every time I finished one, I'd just roll it up and tie a string around it and put it in my suitcase. And by as the years rolled along, the family left Oklahoma in one of those oaky caravans during the Dust Bowl on their way to California, but my people didn't make it. Their old car broke down right out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and to Harris Canyon. They were broke, and all those kids, and that's as far as they got, and I think it's one of the most wonderful things that ever happened to them. They got there years ahead of the big atomic boom and everything, and they all turned out real well off. I think it was a blessing that that old car broke down. My father built a home out on 221 Utah Street. And every time I got a chance to go home to visit my brothers and sisters and mother and father, every time I went home, I had quite a few of these little stories in my suitcase. I bought a big old steel trunk. and. Dad had built a big workshop in the back of the home there. It's still there. I put that old trunk away back in one corner, and I bought the biggest lock I could buy. And every time I'd go home, I'd put these little stories in that old trunk. Why, I don't know. They were very precious to me, but I wouldn't have let anyone, boy, I wouldn't have even thought about letting anyone look at them. You know, I believe that very sincerely that if you're trying to do something, you're really trying, and as long as you're truthful and honest and you don't hurt anyone along the way, I think you'll have help. I know I did. One morning, it was alone, and it was in January. I came into a large town in Texas on a freight train, cold, dirty, and hungry. I knew that I had to get something to eat. I hadn't had anything to eat for several days. And I stayed in, I got into the yards before daylight, just a little while before daylight. I stayed in the boxcar, walked from one end to the other to keep warm. And I wasn't keeping very warm. It was a northern blizzard blowing across those Texas plains. And I didn't have the kind of clothes a boy should have had, but I had all I owned. By the time it got daylight, I walked up into town. As I walked along the street, I was really trying to find a Salvation Army or something where, where I could get something to eat. I knew I had to eat. I passed a hotel, it was a large hotel, and there was an awning out over the sidewalk, and just as I walked by, the door opened and a porter came out pushing a little cart loaded down with suitcases. And right behind them there was a big, well-dressed man with a white hat on and boots. You could tell he was what we call one of the wealthy Texans. I stopped under the awning. It was sleeting, bitter cold, and my clothes were already pretty wet. I leaned up again in the building, and I was watching this man and the porter. They were putting these suitcases in a some kind of a big old car. I don't know what kind it was, but as I stood there looking, the man had his back to me. Uh, I got kind of mad. I thought, well, now here is a man that He's got so much money he can hire another man just to carry his suitcase. Here I am, starving to death. I walked over to him, and I caught a hold of his coat sleeve, and I gave it a pretty good yank. And when he turned around and looked at me, I could see the surprise on his face. And I looked him right in the eye, and I said, Mr., would you feed a hungry boy? 
he looked at me for a second or two, and then he smiled, and he said, I'll tell you what, son, I haven't had my breakfast. He said, let's go back in the hotel. We'll both have breakfast, and he said, I'll pay for it. Well, I didn't say anything, but as we went through the door, I thought to myself, well, mister, if we eat, you'll have to pay for it. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't tell me the truth because he only had a cup of coffee. We sat down at a little table, and I think I ate everything they had in the hotel. While I was eating, he started talking to me, and he asked me, he said, son, what are you doing out in weather like this, bumming around over the country? And I said, I'm looking for work. He said, well, what kind of work do you do? And I said, well, I'll do any kind of work. And he said, well, where do you live? And I told him. He said, well, I think you should be at home with your family. And I said, well, why? Dad can't feed my brothers and sisters, and I'm a grown boy. Somewhere there's a job. He said, well, this isn't right. He said, a boy like you shouldn't be out like this. He said, anything could happen to you. He said, there's some tough old boys out on that road. And there were, too. He reached inside of his coat and he took out a large envelope. He took the contents out of it and he put that in his pocket and he tore the envelope open. He laid it down on the table and he wrote something on it. And he took his time and he folded it up in a little square and he wrote an address on it. And he handed it to me and he says, Son, you take this note to this address and just walk in and give it to the lady behind the desk. He said, I think they'll find a job for you. I thanked the man and walked out of the hotel with him. And I must have been a half a block from the hotel. I turned around and looked back, and he was still standing by that car looking at me. Now, I thought about opening the note on the way looking for this address to read to see what was in it, but I couldn't do it. He had, uh, he'd been so good to me, I thought maybe if I did open it and read what he had wrote, I thought maybe I'd be betraying him some way. I didn't open it. I wished I had a, but I didn't. I think later on that man was one of the great leaders of our country. We've tried hard to find out, but it was so long ago. When I found this address, I think it's one of the biggest buildings in that town. And uh, I walked around it two or three times before I had nerve enough to go in. And, uh, but the thought of getting a job was so strong, I finally, I just ducked my head and walked through the door. And he had told me to give that note to the lady behind the desk. The first thing I saw, there was a row of desks from one wall to the other, and it was a lady behind each desk. I picked the one right in front of me, and what a wonderful lady she was, just a young secretary. I walked up to her and handed her the note, and I said, lady, a man gave me this note and told me to bring it here and I might have a job. And as she unfolded the note, she looked me over from A to Z. And I was scared to death. I don't know what was in the note. I wished I had have read it, but at least I could have got a name off of it. But whatever it was, it must have been something very powerful. She got up out of her seat, and she said, uh, you go over and sit down in the lobby. She said, I'll be gone for a few minutes, but I'll be back. And just as I turned to walk away from the desk, she said, now don't leave. And I said, well, I won't, lady, I'll be here. She went over and uh, just before she got on the elevator, she turned around and looked at me again and she said, now don't leave, I'll be back. 
I don't know what was in that nose, but there was something in it. She was gone, I guess, oh, 15 or 20 minutes, I guess. And when they come back and the elevator doors open, well, here's about 15 well-dressed men with her. And here they come right at me. And they don't know how close they come a losing a country boy right there. <laughs> I came very close to having a runaway. But they came up to him, and one of the men that seemed to be the spokesman, he said, son, don't you have any money? And I said, no, I don't have a dime. And they went down in their pockets, and they made up a collection. It was $44.50. I'd never seen that much money in my entire life. They gave it to me and told me to go get me a room, and to come back the next day. They're going to get me a job. And I'm not sure how many days it was that I went back to that building, but I'd always go to that same little secretary. And she'd tell me, well, we haven't heard anything yet, but the call has gone out. And sooner or later, you'll have a job. I hadn't even asked what this place was. I didn't care, as long as it was a job. And every day where well, she'd say, now, don't leave town, and if you run out of money, well, you tell me, and we'll take care of it. I don't know what was in that note, but it must have been something. I don't know just how many days it was, but one morning I walked in, and I knew when I walked through the door that something had happened because... She got up from behind her desk, and she had a bunch of papers in her hand, and she was smiling all over her face. I walked up to her, and she just kind of beat the papers in her hand, and she said, you have a job. And I said, well, good. Where is it? She said, it's a long ways from here. I said, well, lady, I don't care how far away it is. You just tell me where it is. I'll get there. Well, she said, I don't know. It might be kind of hard to get to this job. And I said, well, lady, it won't be hard for me. You just tell me. I'll get there. She said, well, how would you like to go to old Mexico? I was never so surprised in my life. I said, old Mexico? And she said, yes. I said, well, I've never been there, but if I can get a job, I'll go. She laughed and said, it won't be that much trouble. She said, everything is all taken care of. Your papers are all filled out. And she said, they're putting a brand new crew together. And she told me where to go in Houston. And she says, you go there and you'll have a job. This was a head office of the Warren Oil Company. I went and got with these fellows. It was a brand new crew. They were taking a rig into the jungles of old Mexico, looking for the new oil field. This was an exploration crew. I stayed with them a good many years in the bush country, went on down into the Yucatan country. 